Now, when it comes to They Love the Torah, here's the book we, uh, I'm starting off with called They Loved the Torah. And uh, if I recommend you get the book for, the li- for your library. I'm going to be recommending books all year that you guys, if you really want to get a handle on this stuff, uh, these are the books that you need to have in your library. Now, like this, They Love the Torah, I'm pretty much going to cover that whole book tonight. Okay? I mean, we're going to, there is so much material. But the main thing is, you're going to have the notes, you're going to be able to go back, you'll be able to read it, add your own notes to it. Uh, we have a lot of other books that are on the book list, but this is the, the first book. Then there won't be a book necessarily that will be assigned or you have to jump into for uh, probably a couple months because we're going to kind of go over some other material uh, before we get back into the book. So don't feel like if you can't afford all the books now, don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about for a couple months anyway. Uh, there is another book I am going to recommend called Torah Rediscovered, which is a, a real good book. And uh, here is another book. I don't know if you can even get it, but I had it in my uh, library. It may be out of print. But the reason I want to just mention the name of it because uh, it is so important. This book is written by a Jewish man, and it calls the, fa- the Place of Faith and Grace in Judaism. What? Judaism has grace? Judaism has faith? Of course it does. And uh, it talks about that. Now, uh, as far as the, the beginning here, uh, the name of the book is They Love the Torah. And one of the things I like to say is, I'd almost like to get rid of the word the and say they love Torah. And the reason why I say that, who is the living Torah? He is the Torah. Is Yeshua ever going to break his word? Is the Torah the word of God? Okay, is he ever going to go against his word? So is he ever going to go against Torah? I mean, this is just so logical. So let's look at how Yeshua's family kept Torah. In Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 24, we see that it was eight days uh, were accomplished for the circumcising of the child. His name was called Yeshua which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And then look at this. It says, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished. See, part of the problem is when it says the law of Moses, we always think, well, that was Moses' law, not God's law. No, this was God's law that Moses happened to pen. But it says they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the what? Okay, so we can see it's the law of the Lord is what this is. It's his law. And so we see they they did exactly what the Torah says. It says every male that opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And then look at what it says they did. They offered sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord. Okay, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. But if you didn't know the law of the Lord, you wouldn't know that that's not exactly accurate. It is, but there's more to it than that. So if you go to Leviticus 12, 2 through 4, to see what the Torah actually said, if you'll notice about halfway down, it says, And in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin will be circumcised, and she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying 33 days. Uh, She's not to touch any hallowed thing nor come into the sanctuary. Oh, I didn't have that. But anyway, uh, she's actually the, I didn't have verse 5 through 8 where it goes into it. But what it says is she's actually supposed to bring a lamb. But if she's too poor and can't afford a lamb, then she could bring a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So she did it according to the law of the Lord, but the full text said she's supposed to bring a lamb. Now, how many of you, what that, I don't know if you realize what that tells you. That tells you, first thing, the Magi hadn't come with the money yet. So they weren't there the first eight days. I don't know when they came, if it was uh, several months or a year or two later, but they sure weren't there the first eight days when he was born because they'd had the money to bring the lamb and they couldn't afford the lamb. But little did they realize they had a lamb. They had the lamb of God, didn't they? Okay, now let's look at Luke chapter 2, verse 39 through 43. Notice carefully what it says here. Then it says, when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, then they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew, he waxed strong in spirit, he was filled with wisdom, the grace of God was upon him. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year when? At the... So we see they, were, they kept the feasts. 
And it says when they, he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So they kept all the customs of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, they returned. Well, how long is those days? We see in Leviticus 23, verse 5 and 6, how the 14th day of the first month, that even is the Lord's Passover. Notice it doesn't say the Jewish Passover. It doesn't say Israel's Passover. It says the Lord's Passover. It says on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. And at seven days, you must eat unleavened bread. Okay, so it actually is like eight days long. But what this also tells us is a good deal about his family atmosphere. This was normal for a Jewish family. Okay? And then look at Luke 2, verse 46 and 47. This is uh, after, you know, they had headed out, but he decided to stick around and go to the temple and start talking to the rabbis. And it says, It came to pass after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. Now, don't you think it would be highly unlikely Yeshua would have engaged in a three-day discussion about the Torah with the rabbis if he held an anti-Torah attitude? If he was against Torah, why would he spend three days discussing the Torah? And so in Luke 2, 51, we see Yeshua himself followed Torah. It says he went down with his parents, came to Nazareth. He was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. Well, we know in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, it says, honor your father and mother. Now, let me ask you something. Did Yeshua honor his father and mother? Did he fulfill the commandment to honor his father and mother? So since he fulfilled the commandment to honor his father and mother, you don't have to? Now, tell me something. How many heard? Well, Jesus fulfilled the law, so I don't have to. Let's see. Did Jesus honor his father and mother? Yes. Did he fulfill the law? Yes. Well, then I don't have to, right? Can you see how that doesn't make sense? Okay. So, Yeshua was strengthening the Torah's relevance by showing he followed it. Does that make sense? If he kept it, he followed it. After all, it was his word. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. So let's see about Yeshua's relatives. Were Yeshua's relatives Torah observant? Let's look at Luke 1, verse 5 and 6. Here it says, it was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abijah. I think it's 1 Chronicles 24, you find out uh, it was the eighth course. Uh, but it says, his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, okay, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both what? Righteous before God. They walked in how many? All the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord, and they were what? Blameless. So they were considered uh, a tzaddik or righteous. And so here they, his, his family we just saw was Torah observant. We see his relatives were Torah observant. And they were righteous before God in their Torah observance. And they were walking in all the commandments and the ordinance of the Lord blameless. So we can see walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Now let's look at Mark chapter 6 verse 18 through 20 as a matter of fact who what, what was Yeshua's cousin's name John the baptizer or the Baptist and was he Torah observant well let's look what he says in uh, Mark chapter 6 verse 18 through 20 John said to Herod it is not what was he referring to the civil statutes there or to Torah he was referring to Torah he said, it's not according to Torah for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him he would, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was what? He was a just man. He was holy. Okay, he was set apart. He was just. He followed Torah. Now, I want you to realize Yeshua kept the Torah, and guess what? He practiced what he preached. Let's look at Matthew 5, 17 through 19. He says, think not that I am come to do what? I'm not here to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to do what? And so there's another book I want to recommend. It's called Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus. A lot of people don't know what the word fulfill means. They, they have a Greek mindset, and they see it like a checklist. Oh, he did that one. Let's move on to the next one. Oh, he fulfilled that one. Let's move on to the next one. Oh, he did that one. The word actually means when he fulfills something, it, what it means is he showed how it was to be done. He demonstrated it. Okay, that's what it means. 
Like when it comes to honor your father and mother, what did he do? He honored his father and mother. So that's how he fulfilled it, by showing everyone. You know, it's kind of like you get a, a, a letter from someone. How many of you know that email is not a real good way to communicate feelings? How many of you have got burnt sending an email and people didn't understand what you were trying to say? Because the emotions, that's why they have these emotion cons. You know, am I happy? Am I kidding? Am I sad? The, what the Torah lacked was, it, in, in one sense, the difference, like in John 1, where it says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. He wasn't doing away with one. It's that one was the, the love letter and the other one was the person now here demonstrating it. You following me? That's what it was. It's just what was inferior with the Torah is there was no emotion cons, so to speak. It was a letter. It was, it's written. And so Yeshua came to put flesh and bones on the letter, not to throw out the letter, but to say, no, you guys are misunderstanding this. You're misinterpreting this. Let me show you what it means to love your neighbor. That's how he fulfilled it, by demonstrating the proper meaning of it. And so he goes on to say, now this is kind of scary. Here he just got done saying, I haven't come to destroy it, but to explain it or to demonstrate it. And then he says, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle will in no wise pass from the Torah till everything is fulfilled. Whoever therefore will break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he will be called what? Okay, you still make it to heaven. You still make it to heaven. But do you want to be the least in the kingdom of heaven? Or do you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Not necessarily for our own sake, but for Yeshua's sake. And so he's saying, wow. But the, the problem is more for the teachers. It's not for necessarily the people that are just the students and they think it. But for those people that are teaching, they are the ones that are in big trouble. And then it says, but whoever shall do them and teach them is going to be called what? Great. So we want to be doing the commandments, teaching the commandments. Okay, now let's look at Luke 4, verse 14 through 16. Here Yeshua returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there he went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about, and he, where did he teach? In the synagogues, being glorified of all. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So we see Yeshua kept the Sabbath. Yeshua always kept the Sabbath. Uh, Luke 4.31, it says he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he taught them on the Sabbath days. And so the arguments were always over how he kept it, not whether he kept it. When you read the Torah, you see the Pharisees, the Sadducees arguing with him. He always kept it. The question was how it was kept. Look at John 7, verse 22 and 23. They said, Moses gave unto you, or Jesus is saying to them, Moses gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And you on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I've made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? So the problem wasn't that he kept the Sabbath. The, uh, it was how he kept it. Look at John 9, 14 and 16. Almost all of Jesus' healings were on the Sabbath. Here it says it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay. He opened his eyes. And then again, the Pharisees uh, also asked him how he'd received his sight. And the guy says, hey, he put clay on my eyes. I washed and I see. And it says, therefore, some of the Pharisees said, well, this man can't be of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And so there was a division among them. Now, uh, right here, let me... I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the Talmud. Who has not heard of the Talmud? All of you have heard of the Talmud. Pretty much. Okay. The Talmud was writ, written around 200 years after Christ or so. Okay. And I have hard copies of the Talmud as well as electronic copies of the Talmud. And basically it's just like, like your Schofield Bible. The Schofield is what? Commentary. The Talmud is basically commentary. That's what it is. It's just what the Jews thought. And there's another book we have on our reading list. A lot of people don't know. There was like seven or eight different sects of the Pharisees. So not all the Pharisees disagreed with Jesus. A lot of them agreed with him. Okay? But I'm going to read from you this section. This was written 2,000 years ago. Okay? Now, they had kept it orally uh, 
several hundred years before that, but it finally got written down uh, after the destruction of the temple and everyone scattered and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Now, just for those, since most of you do know what the Talmud is, I want you to know I do not believe the Talmud is inspired. Okay? Uh, I see it as just as commentary. And just like Schofield and Dakes, uh, I have a lot of problem with them. I got a lot of problem with what the rabbi said here too. But that's not the point. What I want you to realize is what they were writing 2,000 years ago. It's, here he's talking about the Sabbath, and he says, if there's a matter of doubt as to the danger of life, and if there's any matter of doubt as to the danger of life, it always overrides the prohibitions of the Sabbath. So they believed you could uh, save someone on uh, the Sabbath. And uh, here it says, if for some reason uh, a building falls on somebody, okay, and you're, well, maybe a building falls, so there's an earthquake in Israel, and a building falls. You don't know if someone is in there or not. Let's say you don't even know. And they said, the Sabbath occurs. What do you do? Because it's work to remove all the rubble. Well, they said, uh, they do remove the debris for one whose life is in doubt on the Sabbath, and the one who is prompt in the matter, this one is to be praised. So they're saying, if on the Sabbath a building fell, you're praised if you work on the Sabbath and you remove the debris to save a life. So a lot of Christians think the Jews wouldn't do anything on the Sabbath. And, but that's not true. They, uh, they would do anything to save a life. Uh, they would break the Sabbath to save a life all the time. So I just wanted you to know that in case you didn't. Okay, and so the people that were arguing with Jesus, some of these Pharisees, some of these Sadducees, we're arguing over their interpretation. How many of you know there's a lot of different denominations in Christianity and they don't all agree? How many know the, the Baptists and the Pentecostals may disagree? And the, the Catholics and the Lutherans may disagree? Well, you've got to understand, there's denominations, so to speak, in Judaism as well. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead of my notes here a minute, but there was these two main guys. Who Does anyone here know these two main guys that lived... Oh, well, let's say 30 to 40 years before Yeshua, what their names were. Okay. Yeah. Hillel and Shammai. And they, they had their own little disciples, their own schools. And believe it or not, Yeshua sided with Hillel almost all the time. Completely. And uh, he would totally agree, disagree with Shammai. But within Judaism, there were all these different little subsets. And we have a book uh, here called Yeshua in the Early Church or something like that. Uh, that's back there, and it goes into that. So how many of you know you don't want to be lumped together with a bunch of other people that maybe are wackos? Okay? Well, that's the same thing. We can't, you can't lump all of one race. You can't lump all of one ethnic group or one, you know, one church. You have people in every church. Every church has got dysfunctional people. We're all dysfunctional, okay? There is no perfect church. And so uh, even within Judaism, you have to realize you're going to have different groups, that disagree. And in Luke 6, 1 through 9, here we see it was on the second Sabbath after the first one. He went through the cornfields and they were plucking ears of corn and they did eat, rubbing them in their hands. Now, if you go down to uh, what I have in bold there on your notes, underlined, Yeshua said, look, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. In other words, he was saying, look, I'm the one that wrote the book. I can tell you what's right and what's wrong. Okay, he wasn't saying uh, that the seventh day is no longer the Sabbath. He says, look, I'm the one that wrote this thing. I'm the one that is going to tell you how it's kept. And so it says that it came to pass also on another Sabbath, he entered into a synagogue and he taught. And there was a man who right hand was withered. Okay, and so all the scribes and Pharisees were watching to see if he was going to heal. And the last sentence there says, he says, is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Well, they knew the answer to that. Okay, and so what did he do? He held the guy's hand. So he didn't break the Sabbath. He was trying to tell them, this is part of the Sabbath. It's to bring healing. Now look at, uh, here we see at the top, they were going through a cornfield. Well, look at what the Torah says in Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. He says, when you get in the grain from your land, this is the farmer, he says, don't let all the grain be cut from the edges of the field. Don't take up what has been dropped on the earth after the getting into the grain. Don't take all the grapes from your vine garden or the fruit dropped on the earth. Let the poor people, the people from another country, these strangers, let them have them. I'm the Lord your God. So what was God trying to tell them? Be generous. Share. Okay? Now, 
the, the legalist is going to decide, okay, how much is, is the edge of my corner of my field is one foot. See, I'm following the Torah. I'm, I've got one foot of my edge. Whereas the merciful person will give, you know, maybe 100 yards in the edge. Okay, so the, the whole question is, is how do you keep it? How do you define it? In, uh, okay, I have here Yeshua as the Messiah had the right to teach the true meaning of what the Sabbath was because the law came from him. Uh, there were different sects of Pharisees, uh, Hillel and Shammai. And listen to this. Do you know that the, just uh, among the Pharisees and in literature from that time, they had over 300 points of conflict. So you can't say all the Pharisees agreed with each other or the Sadducees. There were over 300 points of conflict. And all Yeshua did, he jumped in the middle of the conflict. And he says, I'm going to grab the bull by the horns or whatever, and I'm going to tell you guys how, it's, how the cow ate the cabbage, so to speak. Okay, so they and their disciples loved the Torah, yet all, all, I'm talking about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all the people that disagreed. They all loved the Torah, yet they daily argued and debated each other over the most important issues of life to all of them is understanding the Torah. So Yeshua simply jumped in the debate. Okay, I mean, they didn't say you don't love God. And, uh, they said, okay, you love God. Well, let's, let's how you do this. Okay, and now that, that's very important to understand. Uh, for here's another example of this word fulfilling. Well, Yeshua fulfilled the law. That you really need to get a hold of this thing. There's another level of understanding on this. Back then, when the rabbis would argue, or the Jewish people would argue over how something is to be kept, such as the Sabbath or whatever, if, if I disagreed with you, I would say, you're destroying the law. And they would say, no, sir, I'm fulfilling the law. Because they're saying, I am doing it correctly. And I'm saying, no, you're not doing it correctly. So the whole concept of Ju Jesus fulfilling the law, he's saying, I am showing you how to do it correctly. Not fulfilling it done away with. He's saying, I'm showing you how to do it. Okay, in um, Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 21... We see they went to Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into a synagogue, and he taught there. And here we have a guy in verse 23 with an unclean spirit. He cries out. And then in verse 29 through 31, uh, after Yeshua heals him, then he goes into uh, Simon's wife's mother, who is sick of a fever, and he heals her as well. So we see all the time on the Sabbath, what is Yeshua doing? Healing people. Did he break the Sabbath by healing people, or did he show them what they were supposed to be doing on the Sabbath? That's how he fulfilled it. Now look at Mark 1, 32 through 34. But look what happens here. At even when the sun did set. Okay, so now it's Sabbath. The sun set. So now they're going into what's called Havdalah. Okay, the Sabbath is over. Now they can work. It's sunset. And so what did they do? When the sun had set, now they're bringing to him all that were diseased, that were possessed with devils. The city was gathered together at the door, and he still healed many. Some of them would be on stretchers, and they felt carrying a stretcher maybe you know, breaking the Sabbath, so we'll wait till after the Sabbath and we'll bring him and uh, then he would heal him. And then in uh, Luke 13, 10 through 12, again, we see he's teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath and he heals a woman. And then in Luke 14, 1 through 5, uh, here it says, it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees, he was, went in to eat bread on the Sabbath day and they were watching him. Now, what kind of a bread do you think they were eating? Uh, well, on the Sabbath day, they could eat leavened bread. It was called challah. How many of you have ever had challah before? That's more than likely what they were eating. I just got a, an email today, how to make pumpkin challah for the holidays. Ooh. Doesn't that sound good? I'll have Tom put that on the Internet. Another one was a Milky Way challah. They would take Milky Way, and, you know, they would cut it up and put it inside of the dough. And I didn't put that one on the internet, but I might. <clears throat> I think Tina's going to make some for us first and check it out at the office. Okay. Um, okay, so in Luke uh, 14, 1 through 5, you know, he's at this guy's house, and they're watching him while he's eating bread. 
And it says, Behold, there was a certain man before him which uh, had the dropsy, and Jesus answered, spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees, and he said this, Hey, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? He's asking the lawyers. And what did they do? Well, shut my mouth. I ain't going to say a word. And so he took him and he healed him and he let him go. And he answered them saying, which of you will have a donkey or an ox fall into a pit and won't pull him out of the, on the Sabbath day? Of course they would. So he says, it's not man greater than an animal. So Hillel taught that you could heal on the Sabbath day. And Shammai said you couldn't heal on the Sabbath day. So when you read this about the Pharisees or the Sadducees or whatever, you've got to realize the people that were arguing with him were not the Pharisees of Hillel. They agreed with them. It was the Pharisees from Shammai that disagreed with them. So you can't lump everyone together. And so um, there were basically two types of opposition against Yeshua. One of them was how he interpreted the Torah, and the other one had to do with political alliances. Okay? Power struggles. How many of you know oftentimes in religion, in churches, you have power struggles? Political alliances. What? Within the church? Yeah. Okay, uh, look at Matthew uh, 9, 9, verse 11. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why, are you, why is your master eating with republicans and sinners? Oh, republicans <laughs> and sinners. <clears throat> that must be the Democrats, I don't know. But he said, why is he doing this? And so a lot of it was just different kinds of alliances that they had. <clears throat> What do we look at Matthew? Let's take a look at Matthew 12, verse 2 through 7. It says, Here when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Behold, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Oh, my, okay. Now they're getting a little more specific. Let's see what they're saying. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God, and he ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say to you that in this place there's one greater than the temple. Who is that? Yeah, that's right, Yeshua. He says, if you had known what that means, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. In other words, they weren't guilty for doing that. What does God have? Mercy. The Torah is full of mercy. Everyone thinks Torah <clears throat> means it's mistranslated as law. Do you know what Torah actually, the correct definition of Torah is? Instruction. <clears throat> How many of you heard of 2 Timothy 3.16 and can quote it for me? All scriptures given by inspiration of God are profitable for what? Doctrine, Doctrine instruction, reproof and righteousness, right? <clears throat> so what he's saying is, when, he, when they said all scripture, had the New Testament even been written yet? So he was saying the Torah is written for what? Instruction, that's what it is. For correction, for reproof and righteousness. Um, let's see, in Luke 7, 39, here a, a Pharisee had seen something and he spoke within himself saying, this man, referring to Yeshua, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she's a sinner. Okay, so here they're totally prejudging, not having mercy. In Luke 11, 37 and 38, here we have another certain Pharisee who wanted to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisees saw it, he marveled that Jesus did not wash his hands before dinner. Good thing your kids aren't here. <laughs> but they totally misunderstood what was going on. Look at Luke 15, 1 and 2. Then drew near him all the publicans and sinners to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes are murmuring, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. Can you see how they just had the totally wrong attitude? And also, there were political interests involved here. Look at this. This is the... How many of you know politics can be pretty tricky? And we got elections coming up. I mean, uh, boy, I tell you, I mean, a politician often and liars are real close together <laughs> on all sides. But let's, let's look at this. In John eleven forty-seven 47 and 48, it says, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees as a council. And they said, what are we going to do? <clears throat> this man is doing many miracles. If we leave him alone, how many men will believe? So what does that tell you about during Yeshua's time? They all were going to believe him. A lot of people think the Jews rejected the Messiah. No, the, they, were, they were concerned that everyone was going to follow him. And then it says, oh my goodness, you know, if that happens, 
the Romans are going to come and take away both our place and our nation. Sound familiar? That they were concerned about their how many politicians are concerned about their place? Okay. Well, this was a the priests. How many of you know the high priest? How'd you become high priest? And according to the Torah, it was the sons of Aaron, right? And when you became high priest, how long were you high priest? When you became the high priest, for how many years? For life. This is like the Supreme Court of the United States. You were you were high priest for life. Okay, and then there would be a new son of Aaron who'd be high priest for how long? Life. For life. Now, I'm, I'm not going to give you the exact numbers. I have the exact numbers at the office. I don't have them with me, but I'm going to give you an example. From like 500 years, let's say, from Moses until David, okay, let's say there was like 10 high priests. Okay, and then you take the 50 years during Yeshua's time, there were like 50 high priests. They all weren't dying. Herod or whoever was chucking them out, one right out for another. They were political appointments. Okay? And so the, everything had changed. And uh, how many of you know sometimes people like to get into a position by going through political channels rather than through God's channels? In Mark 3, 4 through 6, here he said to them, Is it right to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to give life or to put to death? But again, they said nothing. So looking around him, he was angry, and being sad because of their hard hearts, he said to the man, put out your hand. He put it out, and his hand was made well. Now look at this. The Pharisees went out and straightway made designs with who? The Herodians. Okay, I believe on your notes is a whole little section about who the Herodians were. But uh, they liked Herod, okay? This, these were political appointments. Now look at Luke 13, 31 and 32. At that time, certain Pharisees came to him and said, Go away from this place because what? Herod's purpose is to put you to death. Did you see that? Did you see what I just read? There are Pharisees who love Yeshua saying, Get the heck out of here. Herod's going to try to kill you. So I want you to realize you can't lump all the Pharisee sects as they all hated them. They, uh, there was the vast majority of them loved them. Okay? And they were trying to protect them. And so... Uh, it's always a, it's a little leaven that leavens the whole lump. How many of you know uh, just a little fly in the ointment or whatever can affect the whole thing? And oftentimes what we don't realize in Christianity, when we read the stories in the Bible, it's usually a few people that are making a big mess. It's not the whole crowd. Um, in, this is in rabbinic literature. In rabbinic literature, a fox was a puffed up buffoon who thought he had the power when he really had none. And so when Yeshua called Herod a fox, thinking he, that he had the real power, he was saying, really, he's a puffed up buffoon. <laughs> Yeshua said, I'll show you real power. I'm going to raise from the dead. Now, in Matthew 22, 15 through 17, it goes on again, saying how the... Oh, well, Luke 13, 31 and 32, it goes on to say, he said, go you say to that fox. Jesus said, you go say to that fox, I send out evil spirits and do works of mercy today and tomorrow, and on the third day, my work will be complete. In other words, on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. So he's saying, you know, Herod, you think you got power, I'll show you the power. And then in Matthew 22, 15 through 17, how the Pharisees, they took counsel, how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out to him their disciples with the Herodians. And look at these sly dogs. Master, we know you're true. You teach the way of God in truth. Neither do you care for anyone. You regard not the person of men. Tell us therefore what do you think. Can you give money to Caesar or not? Okay, they're, here they are. They're all trying to catch him in his words. Um, I have here uh, on the notes about Fawcett. Uh, his notes on who the Herodians were. Uh, they really looked upon Herod the Great um, and even Herod Antipas and Herod Agrippa. They thought they could have been the Messiah. Thus, the Herods were forerunners of the coming Antichrist. And like the Old Testament Antichrist, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, they paved the way to apostasy by an introduction of Greek refinements, theaters, and blending of honors to pagan gods along with the recognition of Jehovah and the Torah. A political necessity was their plea for supporting the Herods, however unfaithful to God, and even for supporting the Roman government insofar as the Herodian dynasty leaned on it. 
I don't know, how many of you are familiar when I say Matthew 24? You know what's in Matthew 24? You guys know Matthew 24? You know what most people don't know if you don't know Hebrew roots? Matthew 24 is Hanukkah over again. If you don't know Hanukkah, you don't see that when you read Matthew 24. And so what Matthew 24 is trying to tell you, how many of you know history repeats itself? And they say the one thing we learn from history is we don't learn from history. Now, I just said the guy's name. Who was the bad guy during Hanukkah? What was his name? Antiochus Epiphanes. In other words, God manifest. Now, how many of you ever heard of a guy named Haman? He was about 400 years earlier with Queen Esther and all of that. What was the difference between Haman and Antiochus Epiphanes? What did Haman want to do? Haman wanted to kill all the Jews. Did Antiochus Epiphanes want to kill all the Jews? He's the Borg assimilate. <laughs> that is the big difference. Hitler is going to come as Antiochus Epiphanes, not Haman. The, I mean, the Antichrist is going to come as... <laughs> the, the Antichrist is going to come as Antiochus Epiphanes. Hitler was a type of Haman. Haman came first, Hitler came first. Hitler wanted to kill all the Jews, just like Haman did. But after Haman comes Antiochus, after Hitler comes the Antichrist, and so the Antichrist is going to be just like Antiochus Epiphanes, okay? And his whole deal is going to be assimilation. Assimilation. And that's what we have to be careful of. And I'll be talking about that in the near future as we approach Hanukkah and what that is all about. It's incredible. Okay. Um, now let's look at, let's see. Okay, Matthew 16, 1, the Pharisees and the, came with the Sadducees, tempting him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Uh, Matthew 21, 45, the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard of his parables, and they perceived that he spoke about them. So here's the problem. They, they all knew that he was speaking about them, and they got upset about it. But now, here's the problem within Judaism. But I tell you what, the same problems in Christianity. How many of you think there's traditions of men in Christianity? Does that come as a shock? Okay, well, there was in Judaism too. And so what we have to do is when you sift or when you sort, I like to say I know how to eat chicken. I can eat the meat and throw out the bone. Okay, well, that's the thing that you have to realize when you're reading the scriptures is find out what is meat, what is bone. You know, what, what are the Pharisees saying versus what is the Torah saying? Here, look at this. There's these scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem. They came to Jesus saying, why did your disciples transgress the tradition of who? Okay, because who cares about the tradition of the elders? I, I care about what God says. It says they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And so Jesus said back to them, well, how come you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? So as you're reading these things, you've got to realize what is the commandments of God versus what were the traditions of men. Do you know nowhere in the Torah are you required to wash your hands before you eat bread? It's not in there. Now, were the commandments from the Torah man-made commandments or God's commandments? Okay, so you have to separate the God's commandments from the man-made commandments. Matter of fact, in Matthew 15, 7 through 9, Yeshua calls them all hypocrites because it says, People draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, I don't know how long any, some of you have been saved. I got saved back in 1975. So that's about, what, 35 years? Something like that. In my 35 years, and I believe some of you, I don't know how long you've been saved, have you ever seen people worship God with their lips and honor Him with their mouth, but their heart was far from them? Or am I the only one? Okay? This happens in Judaism, and it happens in Christianity. You can't throw out all of Christianity because some people do that. You can't throw out a, a, a lot of Judaism because people do that. Matthew uh, 15, 17 through 20. If you'll notice at the last part of that verse, he, God says, uh, Yeshua says, to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anybody. Okay? Now, uh, man, time is flying. Uh, we have a lot 
of notes to go. But I'll tell you what, we're going to be stopping here in a little bit. And so the, the theme of this is how Yeshua, is he the cornerstone? Well, the first word of the Bible is Breshit in Genesis 1, 1, which means in the beginning. So if he's the cornerstone from the foundation of the world, and Genesis 1, 1 is the foundation of the world, that means we should be able to find something in the word Breshit. For those of you that were here, I'm going to give you something tonight that I wasn't able to do Saturday morning because I didn't have time that is incredible. Remember the seven days of creation, the day of the Lord says a thousand years. You have seven Hebrew words, and John in Revelation saw a menorah and one in the middle like unto the Son of Man. There are seven branches, there are seven words. I think I have that coming up anyway, so let's look. Okay, Bershit, Bara, Elohim, Aleph Tav. That's not translated into your Bible, guys. That is a Hebrew word that's not in your Bible you missed out on. Okay, Hashemayim, Viet, Haaretz. Okay, so each lamp represents a word. There are seven days. Think of the 7,000 year plan of God. The Aleph Tav is the fourth word. Yeshua, the Aleph Tav in ancient Hebrew was written with an ox and a cross. And here, God died on the fourth day, and the fourth word is the Aleph Tav, which is the Alpha and Omega, okay, but in Hebrew. But look at this. Now watch. So here we have the Aleph Tav who came on the fourth day and died. If you remember the Vav, what does the Vav represent? Man. Okay, it represents, it's a conjunction, it means the word and, but it also represents man because it's the sixth, it's the number six, man was created on the sixth day. We'll get a load of this. On the sixth day, who comes back? The Aleph Tav, who was both God and man. And the Vav is the, represents the nail. They look upon him whom they have pierced. And so here you have one, the Aleph Tav, who is both man and God. They look upon him who was pierced on the sixth day. And then he returns to earth. Isn't that kind of interesting? But moving on, that's not where I wanted to go. So, <clears throat> okay, here's the first word in Hebrew, Breshit, which means in the beginning. We know in Revelation it says Yeshua was slain from the foundation of the world. So, Breshit is the foundation stone. So, that means we should find in the word Breshit how Yeshua was slain from the foundation of the world because that's the foundational word, right? Does that make sense? Well, let's take a look. Breshit is the chief cornerstone of creation, the first building block. How many of you know that the key is often hidden at the entrance of the house? Think of the Bible as the house. The key is, and is in the word breishit. Let me show you what you can find in the word breishit. The word bait means house. The letter bait means house. Here's the word bait in the word breishit, which means house. God came and he built a house, the, the heavens and the earth, but also the temple. Now, you also have reishit, which means first fruits. And we know Yeshua was the first fruits of the resurrection. So we see the resurrection right here in the word breishit. But we also see bar. And in Hebrew, bar means son, like the bar mitzvah. Daniel 3.25, it's translated as son. In Genesis 41.49, it's also translated as grain. So here we see he is the grain of first fruits. Then we have bara, which means to create. And how many of us know that Yeshua created everything? And if you'll notice, uh, well, I think on the next one, bar, or oh, well, rosh, let's go with rosh. Rosh in the word breshit, rosh means head. It can also mean king. Well, we know Yeshua is the head of what? The house. So here we see Yeshua is the head of the house. Oh, okay, when you add the yod or the yud in Hebrew, it becomes my head. So now it's my head. The word sheet in Hebrew means thorns. Barosh in Hebrew in 2 Kings 19.23 means tree. You add the yod, it's my tree. And so what do we see here? The aleph, which represents God, is hung in the middle of the tree. So what do we see? In the word breshit, bar is sun, the aleph represents God. So you have the son of God. Upon his head is a crown of thorns while he's hung upon the tree. All in the word breishit. And shy in the word breishit means gift. And God so freely gave this gift of the son. Brit in uh, Hebrew is covenant. Aish in Hebrew is fire. And we know from Deuteronomy 33, 2, from his right hand came a fiery law. And it's all within the house. 
Remember, Nadab and Abihu brought strange fire, so they were crispy critters. God only wants my fire in my house. And so what do we see in the word Breshit? The Son of God is the gift of salvation. The ancient Tob was the cross. You could also look at it as the Son, who is the Aleph Tob, gave the gift. But anyway, since this is Yeshua the cornerstone, I just wanted to show you how you can see how Yeshua literally was slain from the foundation of the world in the first word in Hebrew. And this is what we're doing on Saturday mornings if you want to come. We're going to go all through the Torah portion. I'm going to show you basically in every chapter of Genesis through Deuteronomy all year long how Yeshua is in every chapter. Okay, we got a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. I saw a hand over here. I thought, okay, right there, Dennis. 1410. Okay. Now I've lost it. Um, it says that he spoke the words of the Father. Right. And that none of those words were his words. But he only spoke the words that the Father gave. And that is so important to realize because a lot of people say, we don't keep God's commandments, we keep Yeshua's commandments. Well, Yeshua says, I only came to do what my Father did. I only came to do what my Father said. That's exactly right. He is the Word of God. And, uh, but that's right. That's what he came to do. All right. Okay. Well, if there's... Okay, one more question and then we'll have to wrap it up because it's 830. I like to be very prompt and start on time and end on time because I you know, want to respect all of you guys' time. Okay, my question is in regards to your reading earlier about uh, Matthew 5.17, and it says, uh, uh, Whoever therefore shall break one of these, whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach them. So the word commandment there, is yes. he talking about the Ten Commandments? Or okay, great, Torah? I'm glad you asked that. If you read my notes, I get into that as we go down. Uh, the Greek word a lot of times is entelos, which in the Septuagint, which was written 200 years before Christ, when the Torah was written in the Greek, they would use that word to refer to all the commandments. Right. So uh, our tables are opened. Remember, I've got these, if you didn't pick them up, on the Hebrew vowels that are back there. We also have this other thing that we didn't have Saturday. Uh, be sure to pick that up if you didn't pick it up, as well as any other notes. So let's stand and pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you so much for your Torah, for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us a paradigm shift. Father, concerning you and concerning your word, how it truly is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, that you would just implant that in our hearts. In Yeshua's name, amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.